From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. On the show today, we're going to be discussing a lot of things, including the topic of asexuality. Yes, you heard that right, asexuality. We're going to be talking to Dr. Anthony Bogart from Brock University in Ontario, Canada, who is an expert on human sexuality. But before we get to that, we are going to talk about how we can reclaim the American dream. And to do that, we have on the show award-winning journalist Hedrick Smith, Hedrick Smith is a Pulitzer Prize winning former New York Times reporter and editor. He is also an Emmy Award winning producer who has established himself over the past 50 years as one of America's most distinguished journalists. He is the author of five books and co-author of two others. His current book is Who Stole the American Dream? A probing historical analysis of the roots and causes of rising economic inequality and gridlock in Washington, D.C. And his latest project is what we're going to be talking about today. It's a website called Reclaim the American Dream. Here to tell us all about it is Hedrick Smith. Welcome, Mr. Smith. Hello. Glad to be with you. Welcome to the program, Mr. Smith. I want to start with the title of your website, which is reclaimtheamericandream.org. When was there an American dream to be reclaimed? You know, over the past 50, 60 years, the average person in the U.S. has had a economic stature lower than all Western countries. We didn't have universal health insurance, paid vacation, paid sick leave for family, relatives, paid child care, free tuition for universities, and many more conditions that Western Europeans and often Canadians just took for granted. So explain to the listeners, what do you mean by the American dream and reclaiming it? Well, you can make some comparisons with other countries, but certainly in terms of our own history, the period of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s was really the heyday of the American middle class. People who work for major companies, companies with more than 100 employees, that isn't even major, but they had, 85% of them had had pensions for their lifetime. 75% of them had fully paid health insurance. They were signed on the contracts, most of them with unions working for the auto companies, steel companies, electronic companies, and so forth, where their pay was going up. They were making enough money where they could make a down payment on a modest house, make the mortgage payments, and when they wound up retiring, they at least owned their own home, so they had that security. Social security was there. I mean, the picture that we've seen since then, Ralph, as you well know and have documented, is just abysmal since the 1980s onward. Those numbers that I cited have all gone downwards. Today, you know, fewer than 20% have got pensions from their employers. They're paying 401ks. They're paying their own pensions. They're paying most of their own health care. Jobs are not steady. I mean, in the old days, if there was a downturn in the economy and auto workers or steel workers or others got laid off, When the economy came back, they got their jobs back. Nowadays, in the last recession, when people got laid off, eight or nine million people got laid off, those jobs were gone when the economy recovered, and they moved from a pretty good manufacturing job that paid $20, $22 an hour to being a a gatekeeper or somebody else at Walmart or working in a retail store for eight or nine or $10 an hour with no benefits. So the contrast between the living standard we had, which I think for a lot of people was a dream, they owned their own home, they had a steady job, they had rising income, they had some protection, and they had the hope that their kids would have a better life, that their kids would be able to go to college. That dream has been lost in this country, and I think there are ways in which we can reclaim it, and people are fighting for that, and I hope we talk about that, you know, pushing up the minimum wage, getting employers sharing more of their profits, talking about the kinds of things that you were talking about a few minutes ago, and that is free tuition. You know, you've got Tennessee and Oregon have now announced they're going to have free tuition for community colleges. Pretty modest beginning compared with Europe, but at least it's moving in the right direction. It's moving back towards helping the middle class sustain a decent standard of living and have a better hope for the future. You know what's interesting when you look at the past, there's an argument that can be made that the peak wage for most American workers was still in 1973 adjusted for inflation, and that was during the Nixon years. But Richard Nixon, really the last president from the Republican Party to be afraid of liberals, he was really afraid of the rumble from the people coming out of the 60s. 
And as you know, he had Daniel P. Moynihan as advisor in the White House. And look what he was proposing. He proposed a health insurance plan that was better than the one later proposed by President Clinton. He proposed a minimum incomes plan that conservative economist Milton Friedman wrote for him. He pushed for a drug policy that focused on rehabilitation instead of incarceration. And he had a lot of other remarkable moves. And I've always said the lesson of that, you know, he signed off on the establishment of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Environmental Protection Administration, Product Safety Commission, the air and water pollution laws. I attribute that to his perception that there was a rumble out there coming from the 60s and that he didn't want to see any mass demonstrations and marches and sit-ins and the kind of activity on campus. What do you say today, Mr. Smith, about what really is needed for the American people to take control of their future? What do they got to do to organize? Organize around pretty well-known solutions that you put out in your book and on your website, reclaimtheamericandream.org. Well, I love that you start with Nixon because, to me, Nixon was the last progressive president. Nixon governed to the left and more progressively than any of the three Democrats that succeeded him, Clinton and Carter and Obama. He not only did all the things that you talked about, he had a steep income tax on the wealthy. He expanded Social Security roles. I mean, he did a whole lot of stuff that... Today, even Democrats are timid about promoting. I think two things are really necessary. There were two things that to me were the secret of a much more widely shared prosperity and a much more effective democracy political system, if you will, that we had back in that era when Nixon was president. And the Republicans and Democrats governed both parties, governed closer to the Senate. We had two things. We had a business leadership that believed that sharing the wealth was smart economics and smart for business, that if you paid your workers well, tens of millions of American workers and you paid them well, they would go out and spend the money they made and that would drive the growth of the economy. Consumer demand is what drives American growth. I mean, there's a lot of talk in Washington about the job creators as if it was the top 1% or the top 0.1%. That's nonsense. We're not short of capital in America. We're short of consumer demand and we're short of consumer demand because middle class workers are not getting the same share of the growth of the economy and the corporate profits that they were getting back in the 70s when the economy was growing at 3% plus per year on average. And the second thing that we had back then in the 60s and 70s in particular was something you were very much a part of, the consumers movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the labor movement, the peace movement. Here we're talking all across the political spectrum on major issues. People got up and off their duffs. They left their television sets behind. They got out of their rooms. They left their couches and they went out and they marched in the streets. They went to shopping malls and college campuses. They got on talkathons on radio and television, and they demanded change. I mean, the greatest example of that was Earth Day in 1971, April 22nd. 20 million Americans were in the streets demanding clean air and clean water. Richard Nixon, who was a pro-business president, was signing off on legislation for the Clean Air Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Anti-Toxic Substance Act. Congress passed seven major pieces of environmental legislation after the people roared their demand. What do you think has happened? organized and in the streets today, I don't mean in any violent way, just demanding that government serve us and serve what we want. Look at the opinion polls. The people, 80%, 75%, want lobbyists cleaned up, want big money out of politics, want to get rid of dark money, want to raise the minimum wage, want to do something about college tuition and stop the $1.2 trillion of student debt. People want government to do things. The government's not responding, but the people are not now putting the pressure on in the way that they did back in the 60s and 70s. That's the key explanation that we're all looking for. Why, given the maintenance of high public opinion polls behind a great deal of progressive change, reducing inequality, Main Street over Wall Street, changing the corporate tax escape system, all of that. Why are the people not standing up and marching and protesting the way they did in the 60s and early 70s? Well, I think it's starting to happen a little bit, but let's talk about that in a moment. Let's go to your why question. Part of it is 
being flat out pressed to the hilt to try to make ends meet economically. Lots of people who would like to get involved or think about getting involved simply don't have the time or the energy. Lots of people are working two jobs. You got two couples or maybe they're working three or four jobs between them. Part of it is fear. Part of it is that employers have sort of said, hey, if you raise your head and you want to get more money or you want to unionize and we're going to set up a right to work law here, if you want to do that, we're going to move your jobs overseas. So people are afraid of the backlash. Then part of it, people are afraid of the NSA and the government snooping on them. So part of it's fear. But I think more importantly, there's a cynicism about politics. There's a sense that politics doesn't work, that politics is dirty. And looking at Washington, there's every good reason for thinking that. Looking at the campaigns, there's every good reason for thinking that. But people don't want to get associated. So I think that the second thing here is a sense of powerlessness. A guy named Ernie Cortez, whom you may know, is a great organizer in the yes. Southwest, said, said to me at one point, you know, Rick, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, as they say. But powerlessness also corrupts. It corrupts democracy at the core. People feel disempowered, and so they are disempowered. People feel disenfranchised, so they feel that way. Then you've got big money in politics. You've got you've got the gerrymandering. You've got all kinds of problems in the system. But a lot of it's psychological. But what's interesting to me now is to think about where we were four or five years ago when Occupy was making a lot of noise up in Wall Street and it started to go around the country. And that movement seemed to flicker out and go nowhere. But think about it. We now talk about the 99% and the 1%. That's thanks to them. It's in our lexicon today, our public debate about issues in America. And then look at what's going on with Bernie Sanders. I mean, Bernie Sanders is tearing up the turf all around the political hustings. So, you know, there are 15 candidates on the Republican side. Sanders is creating more excitement. And he's basically talking about the agenda of Occupy Wall Street. And now Hillary Clinton's beginning to adopt a bit of it. And even Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and some of the Republicans are now having to talk about inequality of income. Haven't come up with very good policies yet. But it seems to me there's reason to believe that maybe the mood of the country is changing. Whether or not people will get engaged, I don't know. The millennial generation is is not a generation that thinks much about going out in the streets and demonstrating. They prefer to send tweets and they prefer to get on Facebook and that kind of stuff. And after all, it's usually the young who are the foot soldiers of any public demonstration movement. But I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was a couple of years ago. On that point, which is the sort of listlessness of the citizenry, although we can point to exceptions around the country as you do, on that point, how much of this problem do you ascribe to the decline of the labor union movement and to the increase in student debt and to that perennial gadget that's in the hands of young Americans today, the smartphone, the hundreds of text messages, the kind of technological narcissism that seems to be uh, almost a narcotic. Those three. Yeah, well, there's no question the decline of the union movement has had a major impact on the power relationships in America. There are a lot of people today who are sort of either anti-union or lukewarm to unions without stopping to think that they like a five-day week, and it's the unions that got a five-day week and gave them a weekend off. It's the unions that got a 40-hour week. And if you look around the country and you compare the average wages of workers, all workers, not just union workers, in states where there are so-called right-to-work laws, which really means the right to opt out of being in the union, and other states where they're not those laws, where there are unions, the average wages are higher, three or four dollars an hour in state after state. So people don't understand the economic impact of unions. That is a big loss. There's no question about that. The student debt is clearly a factor. I mentioned that people were felt intimidated and afraid. If you're coming out of college and you're saddled with twenty nine, thirty thousand dollars which is the average undergraduate's debt graduating from college today, you're not about to buck the system too hard and get potential employers angry. So that's a deterrent. I don't think it's a total deterrent. Uh, there are now some students who are beginning to rebel and saying they're not going to pay back their loans because their loans uh, were bogus. They got, they got lured into programs that promised them good jobs and they got road to nowhere instead. But I think that is a factor. And then finally, 
you know, the technology cuts both ways. I mean, it's clear that the Obama campaign in 2008, and particularly in 2012, was extremely successful in using the Internet, the cell phone, the technology of this modern digital world to promote Obama's candidacy and help him win two elections. So the technology can be used to affect an effective mass movement. But at the moment, it is too many young people, as you and I probably agree, a distraction. It's too easy to click on a petition drive or to do a selfie of yourself or your friends or to get caught up in your personal life and the narcissism that people describe about the millennial generation. But I think in fairness to young people that they're in many ways more socially concerned. Many of them want to see and live a better social life and not just make money, but they see their way to doing that as being individual rather than banding together and having the kind of demonstrations that you had back in the 60s for the consumer movement, which you were so much a part and part of the women's movement, the civil rights movement, where people literally were getting up and putting their bodies on the line and going to meetings with members of Congress when they came home during their recess sessions and confronting them and demanding you know, higher taxes on the wealthy and increasing the minimum wage. That kind of political activism hasn't yet really caught fire in this generation, and I don't know whether or not it will, but it's certainly well, important that we try. Let's talk about the political parties. I think there's a strong case to be made that this is the worst Republican Party in the Republican Party's history. The Republicans in the Congress can't even agree to expand the highway tax so to repair the nation's highways. They are more indentured than ever before to their corporate paymasters. They are presently against any raising of the minimum wage. They are not inquiring, investigating with their majority the corporate crime wave in America, the fraud on taxpayers, the defense industry fraud, fraud on Medicare. And one can go on and on. They want to repeal Obamacare and they don't have anything in place of it. I mean, this is really, at least to my knowledge, the most extreme Republican Party anti worker anti-consumer, anti-environment, they think the climate change is a hoax, very militaristic, seemingly never seen a war or weapon system they didn't like. Why then, Mr. Smith, aren't the Democrats, the Democratic Party leading the Republicans in the Congress and at the state level? Well, I think you put your finger on something very important, which is the state level, and I wish I'd pick that up in, in terms of the last answer. I think that things are happening at the state level, and part of the problem here is that the mainstream national media is not paying much attention to it. We have at the present time 28 states that have raised the minimum wage to a level higher than the federal minimum wage. Now, you can argue whether or not it's been raised high enough, but you've got Seattle and Los Angeles and SeaTac at $15 an hour when the federal minimum is $7.25. You even have states like Alaska, North Dakota, Arkansas, conservative states passing citizens' referendum, raising the minimum wage at the same time they're electing a Republican senator. So public sentiment is out there to do something. I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago Oregon and Tennessee uh, have now voted in their legislatures to have free tuition for community colleges. And you've got states like, believe it or not, Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, Idaho, looking at doing the same thing. You have 27 states that have now passed a so-called public benefit corporation law, authorized corporations to operate not just for the profit of the shareholders and huge payout to the CEO, but to pay their workers better and so forth. And I could go in field after field. The thesis, my thesis for creating this website, reclaimtheamericandream.org, is to put this information together in one place because I believe that if more people actually realized what was going on in other states, that Colorado passed a referendum by 74% to roll back Citizens United and restore the power of Congress to regulate campaign campaign spending. The California's got the best disclosure law to smoke dark money out of political campaigns. That these 28 states have minimum wages. Item after item after item is going on and it's not happening in Washington. Washington is dead in the water. It's curious that if the Democratic Party was what it was under Lyndon Johnson or under Harry Truman or Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they'd be landsliding the Republicans. They take control of Congress. They take control of the committees. And they can really command the open door for 
changes in this country that really have to go through Congress. They can be heralded a little bit here and there at the state legislature. But when you're dealing with the corporate crime wave, when you're dealing with uh, uh, these uh, corporate managed treaties, NAFTA, WTO, the one coming up, the Trans-Pacific, uh, when you're dealing with corporate tax, uh, when you're dealing with military and foreign policy that's just draining uh, the resources away from rebuilding our country, you, you've got to go through Congress. And I'm really amazed at how many very sophisticated people who've been in politics don't understand that they've got to put pressure on Congress by organizing cohesive Congress watch groups in every congressional district. And as long as the attitude is, well, we'll vote for the least worst of the two parties, I'm not excited about the Democrats, but they're not as bad as the Republicans. That gives a leeway for both parties to get worse every four years being pulled by the corporate lobbyists. And, you know, I spend a lot of time in Washington astounded at how many well-intentioned people on the progressive side and liberal side have given up on Congress. Well, I tell you, there are two things going on, and you put your finger on at least one of them. Both parties raising enormous amounts of money from billionaires and from corporations and corporate executives. So they're beholden to the person who pays the piper calls the tune. You know, mm -hmm. They're beholden to their financiers. And so one of the things we have to do is to break the grip of this mega money that's flowing into both parties. Okay, So there's no question what you're saying, that corporate world and the billionaires have captured both political parties. The only place there can be a fundamental change is to start from below. Start in the state, start with Congress watch, fine, do that in every district, I'm all for that. But get into these movements. I mean, the second thing you gotta do something about, Ralph, is you gotta do something about gerrymandering. I mean, the, the gerrymandering that took place after the 2010 census was horrendous. I've just written a piece, and it's on my website, reclaimamericandream.org. There were seven states where the Republicans control the gerrymandering in the 2010 census, after the 2010 census. And in those states, those seven states, Republicans won 19 more House seats than they earned in terms of the popular vote. In those seven states, the Republicans outvoted Democrats 16.7 million to 16.3 million. Explain to our listeners what gerrymandering is. Gerrymandering uh, is manipulating the district lines of the legislative and congressional districts. So you push all, if you're a Republican, you push all the Democrats you can, and you're in Pennsylvania, you push all of them into a few districts around Philadelphia and around Pittsburgh and maybe Erie, and you say, all right, we'll give them those four or five seats, and then we'll arrange all the other p parts of the state, the suburbs, where we tend to be fairly competitive, we tend to be split fairly evenly between Democrats and Republicans. We'll tie them to rural areas where they're Republican majorities, so we'll get more seats than we want. I'll stick with Pennsylvania. In 2012, more people in Pennsylvania voted for Democratic candidates for the House of Representatives. Pennsylvania has 18 seats in the House of Representatives. So you would expect the Democrats maybe to get 10 and the Republicans to get eight, or maybe nine and nine because it was pretty close. It was exactly the other way. The Republicans got 13 seats and the Democrats got five. Totally lopsided from the results. Same thing in North Carolina, same thing in Michigan, same thing in Wisconsin. And the Democrats do it too on the other side. The problem is you've got safe districts set up by each party. The incumbents get elected again and again and again, and they go to Congress and they pay no attention to public opinion because they've got safe seats. So we gotta bust money and we gotta bust gerrymandering if we wanna get our country and our democracy back. Yeah, as our listeners might want to know, our system is supposed to be structured so you, the voters, pick the elected officials, the politicians. But as Mr. Smith is talking about gerrymandering, depending on who the Democrats or Republicans control the state house and the legislature around the country, gerrymander flips that, where the politicians pick their voters and develop safe seats that are not competitive. So in many districts all over the country, in the congressional area, Area, you have one party dominance. You don't even have a two party contest. And that is the antithesis of democracy, which is why Mr. Smith keeps hammering away in his speeches and his articles on this phenomenon known as gerrymandering. But the courts are starting to wake up on that, right? 
wonderful, wonderful. Can you believe it? The Supreme Court just last month issued a five to four opinion that the people of Arizona who passed a popular referendum calling for an independent redistricting commission, that is not the legislature, not the sitting politicians who like to draw the map so they can stay in office, but an independent commission would draw the map. Well, the legislature said, no, 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 Constitution gives us that power, the U.S. Constitution. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, the people were exercising the legislative power power derived from the people and wonder of wonders literally last week the supreme court in the state of florida said the gerrymandering done by the florida legislature which is one of the seven states i was just talking about was unconstitutional because it was set up to keep the republican party and the incumbents in power and it ordered the state legislature to go back and redraw the boundaries on eight congressional districts in the state. And because of the way districts are drawn, it's going to affect much more than that. That's a very important case. There are lawsuits now in other states, Alabama, Texas, Virginia. There are people starting to move on fixing gerrymandering reform in Virginia and Illinois and other states around the country. California and Washington State have already moved ahead. They have citizens' commissions. There are citizens' commissions in six states in the country. This can be done and it's absolutely vital to getting our democracy back in the hands of the people we're building more material on our website it's critical you come from the mass media the new york times the leading newspaper in the country my reading is that the mass media is exposing a lot more bad things than our underdeveloped democracy is able to take up and uh, move toward reform but one thing about a lot of the newspapers and the, the the better television programs is they don't spend much time on covering civic action around the country. So you have these citizens, they read about these abuses in the locally, state, national, and they try to rev themselves up. They start a new group or they mobilize a do, new direction for an established environment, consumer tax reform, local zoning reform. They never get covered. The local television news is pretty bad. What's your take on what the mass media should do in covering what's actually going on in a positive direction in this country, including the growth of the local economies in contrast to the globalized economies, the credit unions, the community banks, the local sustainable energy, the farmer to consumer market, the community health clinic, local transportation solutions. Give me your take as a real veteran newsman, Mr. Smith, about this, and not just newspapers, radio and TV as well, and PBS and NPR. Yeah, in the first place, I think the media is way too Washington-focused. I mean, if you look at the, where the major news organizations have their resources, that is reporters, producers, editors, camera crews, all the people you need to produce the news, Washington has got way too many people. There should be many more people out for major news organizations, you know, covering California, covering Massachusetts, covering New York, you know, covering Texas, whatever on the kinds of issues that you were just talking about. So part of that is a misallocation of resources. And that's, I, mean, I think we just have to keep trying to work on editors and producers who are in charge of these major news organizations to persuade them that they're missing an important story. They're missing what's happening in this country. My belief is that, that we missed the major story in the country, and I include myself in this, for 30 years. I wrote a book called Who Stole the American Dream about what happened to the American middle class between 1980 and 2010. And basically, we had missed that story until Occupy Wall Street came along and said, hey, there's a 99% and there's a 1%. So, you know, I think that we have the resources allocated badly. I think we're not very good at connecting the dots. The news media at the moment is sort of content with telling you what happened yesterday and giving you a little blip. So people have a hard time putting the blips together and forming a picture about what's happening. That's our job. It's our job to put that together. And, you know, in all honesty, part of this is economics. I mean, the news industry has shrunk terribly. I mean, uh, just to give you a few examples, I mean, CNN shut down, shut down its science unit. It's just to have science reporters that covered health care, that covered climate change, that uh, covered all kinds of scientific discoveries, that covered the actions of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration on pharmaceuticals and so forth. They had specialized reporters who covered that. Their budget shrank. They said, oh, we've got to eliminate that uh, that unit. And you go around. I travel the country quite a bit. I go in and out of cities. And I find, talk to the newspaper editors, talk to the television program and news directors and that kind of stuff. And they say, you know, their staff is now a third of what it 
was before, and they've got just general assignment people. They don't have anybody they can assign to, to zoning or to health care or the local manufacturing and so forth. They're just covering the city council and the and the main races. I mean, part of this is money. I mean, there's, there's just much less money in the news business today than there was. The but you still you is, still think it's worthwhile for our oh, listeners our good. listeners to go down to the local newspaper, or radio, and TV station and talk to what the information needs of the community are with producers and editors and reporters. Most people think that's futile. You disagree? No, no, I, I think that should be done. I mean, there was a whole movement that, that prior to the, the downturn, and I was part of it, uh, uh, called public journalism, in which we were trying to persuade our fellow journalists that we needed to do more that was in the public interest and that the public was interested in. I mean, if you look a lot at the political coverage today on the presidential campaign, a lot of it is inside baseball about what's going on in the within the campaigns of individual candidates. Tactics. Uh, not so much on the substance of what, what candidates are saying. The public doesn't care about the inside baseball. The political reporters love to talk about it. The strategists like to talk about it. The candidates like to talk about it. But the public wants to know where people stand on the issues. So I, I think the, the, the news media and the people who run it can still be educated by the public about what they do. And actually, you know, when they come to the presidential debates, when they have a debate in which they have a live audience of individuals who ask questions, you get very different questions than you do when you have the questions coming from reporters. You need that mix. You need the public engaged. I, I think it's still important to do it. Absolutely. We're coming to the end of our time, Mr. Smith. Let me just ask you one last question for our listeners. Of all the tools of democracy that people can use, the courts, the precincts to vote, the mobilization, what would you urge them to pick up in terms of the available tools so they can begin to mount a democracy movement worthy of its name? Well, I think the key is mounting a democracy movement. I think the key is understanding that it's up to us. If you're going to wait for the politicians to fix it, if you're going to wait for Washington to fix it, it's not going to happen. You have to understand that democracy starts with we, we the people, and we the people have got to get engaged. I mean, that's that's what this website is for, reclaimtheamericandream.org, is to give people some tools, to give them information on issues like student debt, minimum wage, inclusive capitalism, getting dark money out into public public in campaigns, the public financing of campaigns, all kinds of issues like that, gerrymandering, the issues we've been talking about. People need to understand that in Washington State or in Connecticut or in California, which is actually ahead of the rest of the country in terms of its activism, but California in particular, because it's so big and it's such a huge model, the Los Angeles area is particularly important because of the huge population there, moving on these issues, getting engaged, just remembering democracy is not a spectator sport. It only works if we we participate. It's absolutely critical. And voting is absolutely, obviously essential, but it's not enough. After you cast the vote, the lobbyists go to work the next morning to try to undo what you just voted for. We, the citizenry, have to be engaged. We have to be engaged right from the start, and we have to stick through the campaign. And on the morning after the campaign, we got to say to the candidates we elected, we want you to do what we inve- elected you to do. Don't you get off the track. And Colorado, they voted to have their delegation push for a constitutional amendment to roll back Citizens United. What they need to do in Colorado now is to say, wait a second, where are all you guys in the Colorado delegation, you men and women? You should be pushing for that in Congress, and we don't care which party you're in. We voted for this across the board, Democrats, independents, and Republicans. Democracy, I guess, is about showing up and to town meetings, rallies, marches, courtrooms, legislative hearings. You heard it from Rick Smith, as I call him. Mr. Hedrick Smith, who has redefined post-retirement for a a very award-winning journalist. And go to his website, reclaimtheamericandream.org. He's got plenty for you to do on your own behalf, your family's behalf, and your children's behalf and your neighbor's behalf. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Ralph, it's a real pleasure. I wish you wouldn't call me Mr. Smith. You just call me Rick. I know. Thanks a lot. Okay, we'll be in touch. Great. We've been talking to award-winning journalist Hedrick Smith, who is the executive director of Reclaim the American Dream. For more information, go to reclaimtheamericandream.org. When we come back, we're going to be talking about sexual orientation, in particular, the concept of asexuality. I can't wait for that. I'm not going away. Don't you. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up. 
the Ralph Nader Radio Hour is a weekly series where we get to discuss with Ralph Nader what's happening in Washington, what's happening around the world, and most importantly, what's underneath it all. Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan along with Ralph. Remember, if you've missed any of our conversation with Hedrick Smith on the radio, go to our new and improved website, ralphnaderradiohour.com, and catch up with us as a podcast. Leave us a comment, search some of our other episodes. You can also click on a link that will show you how you can purchase a copy of Ralph's latest book, Return to Sender, Unanswered Letters to the President, 2001-2015. Now, this next guest and topic, I've been looking forward to the topic of human sexuality in all of its variations, obviously, is no longer taboo these days. And we've made all sorts of progress as a culture on issues of homosexuality with the recent court rulings on gay marriage. And uh, former Olympian Bruce, now Caitlyn Jenner, has brought a lot of positive attention to transgender issues. But something I've never heard discussed is the concept of asexuality. And here to discuss it with us is Professor Anthony Bogart from Brock University in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Bogart studies human sexuality, including the origins of sexual orientation, asexuality, high-risk sexual behavior, and a new model of women's sexual desire and arousal. He has investigated birth order effects on sexual orientation development in men and women, and his latest book is Understanding Asexuality. Welcome, Dr. Anthony Bogart. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, welcome to our program, Dr. Bogart. My first question is in this direction. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender movement in this country which has now become front page news, a lot of laws being changed, but the basic propulsion of these efforts by millions of Americans was that they were continually discriminated against, they were excluded from jobs, they were denied credit, they couldn't get government benefits, they couldn't participate in the American empire, military overseas, they were often physically assaulted, they were verbally assaulted. So they had really strong reasons for publicly advocating their case for civil liberties, civil rights, because of all these pressures on them, denying right. them the opportunity to participate fully in the society. When it comes to asexuality, people who don't know much about people who call themselves asexual are permitted to wonder what is the grievance of asexual people are there any grievances, or is it what a leading spokesman for asexual people, David Jay, once said when he wrote, there is no such thing as a true asexual. If the word seems useful, use it. At the end of the day, what matters is how well we understand ourselves, not how well we match some platonic ideal of our sexual orientation. And words like asexual are just tools to help us understand ourselves. End quote. So why should people be interested in what asexuals have to say about their asexuality? Well, that's an interesting perspective. It's certainly the case that asexual people can fly under the radar much more easily, perhaps, than um, other sexual minorities. And so in some sense, there's probably less of an issue or less of a sort of social stigma if someone does, in fact, stay under the radar. But it's also the case that asexual people, probably more negative views directed at them relative to other sexual minorities. There's an interesting study that suggests that people tend to, sexual people tend to see asexual people as oftentimes less than human and see asexual people more negatively than other sexual minorities. So I think there is some degree of need for a kind of education. I also think that part of the interest that asexual people have had, especially politically oriented asexual people have had in coming out and voicing their concerns and so on is in part because of there's an increased medicalization of, of human sexuality. And so there was a fairly strong movement to make anyone who is not interested in sex and doesn't have strong sexual inclinations into having a disorder that needs fixing 
And I think, in some sense, uh, asexual people have kind of come out and reacted against that and, and wanted to have their voices heard to say, you know what, I'm not necessarily broken, I'm not necessarily someone who has a disorder that needs fixing. So part of the emergence of asexuality perhaps comes within that context. Tell our listeners what the broader definition of asexuality is. Some asexuals are married, some of them have long-term relationships, and they have romantic relationships. Uh, Why don't you describe that experience? In other words, definitionally, could you help our listeners understand? Sure, sure. The way I define asexuality is a lack of sexual attraction for others. So someone who has very little or no lustful attraction to others, no lustful lure when they look or think about other people, males or females. Now that doesn't necessarily mean, as you suggest, that they don't have romantic attraction, so they may still be interested in forming a marriage, forming a relationship with someone, and have romantic inclinations, love bonds with others. It's also the case that some asexual people certainly do not have any sex drive or very little sex drive and have no interest whatsoever in sex broadly. But it may also be the case that some asexual people, even though they don't have a connection, a lustful connection to other people, may have a kind of non-connected or solitary sex drive. So they may still, for example, masturbate. They may still have some level of sexual tingling and what might be described as lustful kinds of feelings, but they just don't attach it to other people. So there's diversity there with regard to asexuality. Not everybody who's asexual comes in the same form. And is it a consistent pattern throughout a person's life, or do people go from heterosexuality or being gay, lesbians, transgender, they can go into asexual situation in their own life? Is it a constant characteristic, or is it a variable? For most people, it's probably relatively constant, like other sexual orientations. For example, if someone is attracted to the same sex, gay, if someone's attracted to the opposite sex, heterosexual, if attracted to the both sexes, bisexual, if they're lacking an attraction to either sex, asexual. And to the degree to which someone does have attractions for others or lacks them, there is some degree of constancy there. There needs to be more research on that, though. There may be a group of young asexual people who self-identify as asexual, for example, who may have formative experiences early in their life or in in sort of midlife and may change their orientation. But I expect for many asexual people, for example, people in their 40s, 50s, and so on, this has been a relatively constant orientation for them. Now, that's not to say that some people who are uh, heterosexual, some people who are gay, may have fluctuations in terms of their sexual interests, and most sexual people do. You know, they have variation in their lives, so they may come upon some kind of experience that dampens their sexuality for a month or two when they're not interested in sex, or maybe even for six months or for a year. For most asexual people, they perceive themselves as being different. And just like average gay people or average other sexual minorities, they have a sense of themselves as being different than others. And it probably suggests that there's a prenatal or early life influence on the origins of asexuality that uh, gives them that predisposition to be asexual. Could the uh, organization of asexuals and uh, more of them speaking out be an attempt to publicly define an identity? So a lot of people, perhaps younger people, who may feel themselves depressed, they say, well, it isn't really depression. And they say, I've, I've read about asexuality and identify with it. Is that part of the reason? Did that conference of asexual people occur in Toronto? Uh, there was uh, a recent conference in Toronto. In fact, in the last couple of years, there's been a, a couple of conferences devoted to issues related to asexuality. 
to answer your question in terms of one's sense of identity, the emergence of one's identity is an interesting and complex phenomenon. And there's probably a number of different reasons why people form an identity and, and publicly want to express them to come out, so to speak. And one of the reasons why people may need to do that is just to distinguish themselves from others and also form bonds with others who are similar to themselves. But there's probably also political reasons. So it makes for better political activism, if you will, if you have a core group of individuals who all identify in the same way. It kind of motivates the troops, so to speak, if we all have a, a same name or a same label and, and sort of start to see the world, at least politically and socially, in, in a similar way. And so if you want to change things, and some asexual people want to, again, change things so that, for example, society, and particularly the medical community, who doesn't necessarily see them as broken or, or having a disorder, then having an identity is an important thing. Do you think that it could produce discrimination as it becomes more visible and then people who are not considerate about human relationships in effect begin a typecasting? And, I, I think so. Has, has that started yet? I, I think it, it's very possible, again, you know, as I was mentioning at the beginning of your show, there is some evidence from, uh, from research studies suggesting that asexual people are seen more negatively than other minorities, and probably they're seen as very foreign and different and unusual, and probably are not trusted in some sense. It, you know, in that context, even though asexual people can fly under the radar more than perhaps other uh, sexual minorities, if they do come out, they may be exposed to more discrimination relative to other minorities, and therefore there may be some need for asexual people to form a cohesive group, form an identity, and use that identity as a kind of energizing force for rallying against certain social and medical things that they don't like. Have they been studied on a, a more political level? In other words, you know, someone can say who doesn't know much about asexuals. Well, you know, they're no longer distracted. They're not getting into all these trysts and intrigues and uh, introversions. Yeah. They have more time for community life. They have more time to be <laughs> extroverts. They have more time to do things that might be called civic rather than highly personal engagements. Right. Uh, anything to that? I think it's it's a reasonable thing to put forward as an idea, but I don't believe there's been any sort of research that's really looked at sort of level of community, political activism, and compared groups such as mm -hmm. asexual versus sexual people. But it's an interesting hypothesis. Well, before we conclude, there are a couple of questions that came to us, people who, who knew we were going to do this program. And you can right. see that they come from an almost zero knowledge about uh, yeah. people who call themselves asexual. But let me toss a few your way. Here's sure. one. Can Viagra turn an asexual into a sexual person? Well, that's interesting. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Most asexual people actually function plumbing-wise. So they can have physical arousal experiences. They can have erection, vaginal lubrication. So it's not necessarily the case that if you assume someone is asexual that they don't have those arousal experiences. So Viagra or other erectogenic drugs may end up giving someone an erection under certain circumstances that would normally occur. But for most asexual people, a lack of an erection or a lack of sexual arousal isn't really a defining feature of them. Some may have issues or may feel like they don't have any kind of physical arousal experiences, but many asexual people still function physically. So I don't think that Viagra or any other erectogenic drugs would end up changing an average asexual person. And the second question comes from this uh, notorious columnist, Dan Savage. I'm sure you've heard of him. And he says, I have, yeah. he, he says, quote, calling oneself asexual is just an escape from conflicted feelings about sexuality, end quote. What's your response to him? Perhaps some asexual people who self-identify as such may have conflicted feelings about sex. And, but I would also suggest that probably for the most part, for those individuals who lack sexual attraction for much of their lives or well, all of their lives, such descriptions probably don't make that much sense. But, you know, again, there's a diversity of individuals who probably fall under the umbrella of self-identified asexuals, and perhaps 
do have some kind of conflicted feelings about it, and therefore it may apply to a small minority of asexuals. One thing that I think is interesting within the context of the study of asexuality is why is it interesting to look at or examine? Um, And of course, we understand that small group of minority people better by studying asexuality, but we also understand sexuality better by studying asexuality. And here's one example. We understand better how, for example, romantic and sexual attractions can be separated or decoupled, even in average typical sexual people. So, for example, average sexual people may have some kind of romantic inclinations that are separate or independent from their romantic inclinations. And that's an interesting piece of knowledge and information that's important within the context of studying asexuality. But there's other reasons too. I mean, there's lots of other reasons why uh, the study of asexuality is important. We kind of get a bit of a, a new view or new lens on sex. We get to see, for example, that our culture is just saturated with sex. And we get to see how oftentimes, as, as Ralph was suggesting, how preoccupied and odd sex is sometimes in individuals. I sort of suggest that sex is part of the great story of life, but it's also kind of mad and and crazy at times in individuals. And if you remove yourself and perhaps take an asexual view, you can also see some of the complexity associated with human sexuality. So for me, as a sexologist, One of the reasons why studying asexuality is important is we get to see a kind of new view on sex, and and that's very interesting to me. Indeed. Steve, you had a question? Yeah, Dr. Boy, I have a couple of questions. First question is, what percentage of the population does identify as asexual? We don't know about the identification aspect, but I did a study in 2004 that looked at a question with regard to sexual attraction, and it was a national sample in Britain, and in that particular sample, about 1% indicated that they lacked sexual attraction to others, and in fact, they never had sexual attraction to others. But we don't really know for sure. We need uh, more research on it. In my book, I suggest, after reviewing not just that early study in 2004, but also more recent studies, that 1% may be a reasonable working figure, but we need more data on it. My second question has to do with, we always associate libido with power and historical figures like John F. Kennedy or Bill Clinton, even our founding fathers like Jefferson or Franklin were sort of libertine in their sex drive. And what is the relationship between sex drive and power? And if you are asexual, does that mean you are less aggressive, less power grasping? That's interesting. There is an interesting but complex relationship between sex drive and power, and it's partly to do with the hormone testosterone, which I'm sure you guys have heard of. And there is some evidence, for example, that when testosterone increases, both sex drive increases, at least in a a somewhat complex way, and also one's feeling of dominance and power may increase. So there is some degree of relationship there, but it's a complex one. And with uh, regard to asexual people, it's never been studied, but it is interesting to suggest that perhaps all the complexity and perhaps elements of dominance and also this strange madness that I talked about with regard to sex, if that's absent in asexual people, then you may have people who are less inclined to perhaps show tendencies towards this kind of dominance or power kind of motive. But that's just speculation. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Boger. Our time is up. Can you tell our listeners how they could reach you if they choose to? Yeah, they can email me. It's tbogart at brockyou.ca. tbogart, T-B-O-G-A-E-R-T, at brockyou.ca. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting discussion with Dr. Bogart. I appreciate your questions. Thank you very yeah. much, guys. Thank you. Bye now. We've been having a fascinating discussion with Professor Anthony Bogart, expert on human sexuality in the psychology department of Brock University in Ontario, Canada. His book is Understanding Asexuality from Roman and Littlefield Publishers. We'll post the link for that on ralphnaderradiohour.com. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. More after this. (laughs) 
From Pacifica, you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, www.nader.org. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm once again Steve Scrovan along with Ralph, and I think we have just enough time to get to at least one listener question. And this question, Ralph, comes from Michelle Giraud. And she writes, would you support the U.N.'s rights of the child? Only the U.S. and one other U.N. member country have not signed. Of course I would. Child abuse is very widespread, not only domestic abuse, but millions of children working in dungeon factories and mines as child labor around the world. The U.N. Rights of the Child initiative has been supported by every other country except the United States and I can't remember some other country. And the reason is there's always a hardcore in Congress that has to ratify treaties who think that any of these treaties is an infringement on U.S. sovereignty. These are the same people who don't think that NAFTA, the World Trade Organization, and other corporate managed treaty despotisms are a violation of U.S. sovereignty. Well, thank you for that question, Michelle. That's our show. I want to thank our guest, award-winning journalist Hedrick Smith. Check out his website, Reclaim the American Dream, at reclaimtheamericandream.org. And also, Dr. Anthony Bogart. Check out his book, Understanding Asexuality. I'm Steve Scrovan. David Feldman will hopefully be back with us next week. I'll talk to you next week, Ralph. You'll be here, right? Yes, indeed. Thank you, listeners. Spread the word. Get to us on more stations and keep the questions coming. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Steve's in the temple, too much money changing hands. It's really very simple, just make a list of demands. We demand freedom, we demand equality, we demand justice, it ain't gonna happen until folks like you and me just stand up, well you've been sitting way too long, oh stand up, you know what's right and you know what's wrong, rise up, don't let the system hold you down, stand up, Ooh. stand up, You're tired of trying You say we have no choice Say you're just one person And who will hear your voice 